If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. And while you're turning there, uh, as always, I covet your prayers and uh, want to be found in the will of the Lord. Uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, in the first verse. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone yeah. that it be made bread. There you go. And Jesus answered him and said, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, shoot him, shoot him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for what is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. And he brought him unto Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall, not give, he shall give his angels charge over thee, Amen. and in their hands... They shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed him for a season. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you and give you great glory and honor as you sat on the throne this morning. Uh, beside your dear son, and we praise you for that. God, we pray that this morning that you'd send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, on this place this morning and thrill our souls with your word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching uh, regarding the Holy Ghost this morning and what his job is and... Uh, Excuse, and uh, what Satan does to hinder that. Now, let me say this. Of all the things in the spirit world, Satan does his job best. But uh, 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 he said, the Bible says, they cast the devils to the earth, and Satan is their leader, and he does a phenomenal job of discouragement. He does a phenomenal job of demonic possession. He does a phenomenal job of, uh, of uh, see, if you let the devil a hold of you, saved or lost, when, when you're being hindered, the Holy Ghost don't come your way. And the reason why is because you're giving credence to the devil. Uh, we as the Lord's people need not never do that if, if, if we can. Now, in the first verse, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Now, can you imagine uh, Christ in, in the flesh there and then the Holy Ghost on top of that, two members of the Godhead in perfect union here on the earth. You don't hear of that very often. In fact, if I understand the Word of God correctly, this is the only time it comes. And, and, and what a phenomenal thing that would be. Now, as Baptists, we don't like to say this a lot of times, but wouldn't it be a wonderful thing this morning to be full of the Holy Ghost? Amen. Uh, don't scare me a bit. I crave it. I want it. Because you know what? You find all through the Word of God, and David being a perfect example, when he was at his worst, he begged for the Holy Spirit. He, uh, will thou ever forsake me? See, he, he, was, he was concerned. And a lot of times, as the Lord's people, what we need to do is just pray that this word would be made living, and the way that it's made living is by the Holy Ghost. Verse 2. Being, uh, 
excuse me, uh, the rest of verse 1, and was led by the Spirit, the very thing, same thing, being uh, full of the Holy Ghost, and led by that Holy Ghost into the wilderness. Now, every one of us at one time or the other in our spiritual life has been in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Now, in the wilderness, you can't find your way. In the wilderness, you're isolated from other people on the general if you're by yourself. Now, I remember years ago, me and my friend that got killed in the car wreck, Steve, we were out wandering around in uh, hills around Stewart County, and most of it I knew really well, but where Steve lived, there was a huge farm back over there that I had never been to before, and we got lost. But you know what? This was the thing, we had each other. Mm -hmm. What if you'd been lost by yourself? What if you'd been the one lost and uh, alone? Now, let me say this, in the sense of being in the wilderness, you don't have to be spiritually lost. In other words, here's the Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness. The very Emmanuel, Son of God, He was in the wilderness. And listen, if you've not been in the wilderness yet, you will be. And, and so we find that as well. Uh, verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now, most Gospels don't... Uh, teach this or, or point this out, maybe it's a better way, it just says that he was 40 days in the wilderness. But I want you to see that the whole 40 days, according to Luke's gospel, was temptation. Every day for 40 days. Can you imagine living like that? Every day you come and tempt him, and, and we have the, the three instances where we know what was said, but what about the other times? What kind of poking and prodding did he do? What, what kind of things did the devil say uh, to the Almighty in the flesh? Now, another thing I want you to see is now the Holy Ghost is gone. So Jesus is on his own. See, you're going to have instances in your life time and time and time again when you're on your own. And, and, and so we find then that Jesus is being tempted of Satan himself. And the devil said unto him, verse 3, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that, he may be that it may be bread. Now, he was hungry after that 40 days, and the devil saw opportunity to tempt him. Now, I want you to see the temptation on the beginning is very mild. Make your own bread. You know what? His temptation to you in the beginning is going to be mild. Skip church. Corona, the corona's around. Right. Nobody's going to think anything about it. Skip church. And then he's going to up the ante, and pretty soon you'll never come back. <laughs> See, that's how, that's how the devil works. So we find that that... Satan is smart enough to begin with the little things, to begin with what seemingly doesn't matter. And Jesus answered him and said, It is written, Thou, that man shall not live by bread alone, the safety of the flesh, the nurturing of the flesh, the abiding with the flesh, but by every word of God. So in other words, if this word of God says it's wrong, it's wrong. This should come first. It always has been first. It always should be first. And we don't need to be deceived in any other way. Verse 5, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain, shoot him up. Uh, into a high mountain, shoot unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. Now, I want you to see, this is my personal belief, that when he's show, shooing all the kingdoms, it says in a moment, I don't just believe it was the existing kingdoms, I believe it was the kingdoms of the world. He got a glimpse of the United States. He got a glimpse of China. He got a glimpse of the whole thing, the power and the majesty. Now, I want you to see, here we find that the devil does not understand God. Because, see, 
He's looking at the flesh and all that the flesh can build, and it's magnificent. And he don't know that heaven's better. He, do, he doesn't know that God's kingdom is nothing compared to this trash down here. He, he doesn't understand a spiritual kingdom. And why? Because he's lost. You know why people don't run to Jesus? They do not understand the kingdom. Right. And without the goodness of God, they'll remain there all the days of their life. Right. And so we find then that <laughs> he's putting something to God, first of all, that God uh, already owns. And the second thing is nothing compared to what he has. And the devil taking him up to a high mountain, shooting uh uh, excuse me, I read that, uh, verse 6, And the devil said unto him, All power will I give thee in the glory of them, for, thou is, for that is delivered unto me, and whosoever I will, I give it. Now let me say this, he was offering Jesus a bill of goods. Right. You know what? He offers us a bill of goods too. It'll be easier not living that way. What does it matter? You still love Jesus if you don't go to church. You still love Jesus if you don't give your life to the ministry. You still love him anyway. It'll be okay. That's a bill of goods. Right. Now, he said, all of these kingdoms will I give you because they're mine. But what does the Bible say concerning Pharaoh? It says this. For this reason, I raised him up. See, the whole, the whole nation of Egypt went down because God raised it up to start with. Mm -hmm. So he offers Jesus something that he's not even able to deliver. You know why? Because he's a liar and he's a thief. That's his nature. And so we find that... Uh, Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 9, And he brought him to Jerusalem, uh, the Lord's place, the Lord's city. And he brought him unto Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Right. For it is written, and he knew the Bible, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee psalms 91 11 and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone and jesus answered and said to him it is said thou shall not tempt the lord thy god now here i want you to see that jesus presents himself as god because who's he's tempting? He's tempting Christ. But hey, he says, you're tempting God. See, all in one. In this temptation of Christ, you see all three persons of the Godhead. Every one of them there. And, and, and so he was letting Satan know, hey, you're dealing with the Almighty. You're offending God. So when we let something interfere with us, who are we offending? God, right? Yeah. And, and so verse 13 says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed him for season. Right. Now, you remember this, you may get a great victory today over Satan or one of the smaller devils, but he's on his way back. Uh, the closer you get to God, the harder he's going to fight. Right. The closer you get to the perfect will of God, where he wants you to be at the very moment, at the very time, the more he's going to oppose you. And listen, he's going to take people that you wouldn't imagine to oppose you in every way. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, what we need to do, if we can, and if we understand, is identify the devil or the demons when they first show up. Because see, if you can see your enemy, if you can identify your enemy, you know how to fight. But if you don't, they'll cut your throat before you know it. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. 
Matthew chapter 4. We're just going to read one verse. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24. The Bible says, And his fame, meaning the Lord Jesus, and his fame went throughout all of Syria, all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments. Now, I want you to see the first of all, was the, the, the physical things wrong with the body. Uh, disease, cancer, pneumonia, whatever you can put into that in injection, they brought in the sick. And then a lot of people say the torments uh, were demons, but not yet. We'll get to the demons. Torments can be thoughts. Torments can be pain. You ever been in a lot of pain? I like to say, Lord, thank you that I've not been in a lot of pain over the years. But when I had my brain surgery, they, the scar, the, the incision didn't hurt. The staples hurt. Because every time I moved my head, the staples would pull. And I was very glad to get rid of those staples. You know what? Pain will hinder you from serving Christ. Sure. They really will. And so... These individuals that had various types of torment came before Jesus and he healed them. He had dominion over it. He was over their condition. He was over their situation. And those that were possessed with devils. Now, there I want you to see the distinction was there were individuals that were... Uh, that, that were in torments that were natural. There's natural torments to the flesh. And then there were other individuals that were completely devil-possessed. And listen, dear friend, they're still out there today. They're still running around. They're still doing the devil's bidding. They're still just as full of demons as they were in the ministry of Christ. Don't ever believe anything different because you know what? Just if you minimize Christ, there's no power. If you minimize devils, they'll take you over. Amen. And so we find that the Lord had dominion. And you remember this morning, if you're being hindered by these devils, if you can see them in your life bringing you down, if you can identify them around you, I want you to see that you need to begin to pray. Because our Lord has dominion over all. And so Jesus helped them. He had the ability to uh, cast them out and get rid of the problem. Now I want you to see what some people say is devil possession and is not. And, and they can be confusing, but there is some distinction. And those that were lunatic. So we find other individuals that were mentally ill. Now there are some people who are mentally ill that, that present as though they're demonic and just as surely there are some, you know, man, they're full of the devil that just have some chemical imbalances up here and they don't think like you and I do. And that, that they're both. Isn't it a wonderful thing though that he, that he has dominion over that? That, that he's above that, that, that no matter what they think and what their situation is, we can pray to the Lord God of heaven, and he still has the ability to deliver them. So it is very specific to, to distinguish the demonically possessed from the mentally ill. Then he says, and, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. So I want you to see that the Lord Jesus has dominion over this. Now we're going to see it, and we're going to be able to identify it, but don't be so scared that you don't know the Lord is, he, he's over it. He's got it. It's under, it's under his dominion, not under Satan's. And, and, and so we find then uh, that the Lord Jesus, a portion of his ministry, and then he gave it to the apostles, and it became an apostolic gift as well, that they could do the very same thing. That they had the dominion to cast it out. But if you remember one time, there was a very great demon 
that came their way, and they said, why, why cast we cast him out? And he says, this one only goes by, by prayer and fasting. You, you ever wondered why we don't fast more than we, than we do? Sometimes I have to call for a general fast, forced to fast at all. Have you ever wondered how that cripples your spirit, man? Just because you don't. And you know what? I don't have to call for a church-wide fast for you to fast on your own. To find, to find a place, time, and a way where you give up food. Now, let me say this, and I, I did touch on it, and we're going to go on in a minute. But, you know, the Lord, if, if you follow Luke's accounting of the gospel there, it says that he went without food for 40 days. You know what? If we really got down, and I know some groups that do this, you can go without food for a long, long time. Now, you need your water, and you need your drink, but you know why we don't fast for 40 days? We don't have our flesh under control. Right? It comes first. And, and so we find then that the Lord is, uh, is very, very clear that this is a real thing that people do become demonically possessed. The Gospel of Luke, this time chapter 8. Now, I, I, will, I, don't, I want you to make note that all this is New Testament teaching. It's not Old Testament. It, it's the dip, dispensation that we presently look, live. The Gospel of Luke. Uh, chapter 8, in the first verse, the Bible says, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and shewing the good tidings of the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to think just a moment. How many times have you heard a message concerning the kingdom of God? And when you have heard it, I would be willing to back my little place on Tobacco Port Road that it's the millennial to come. That is not the only kingdom of God. He was preaching it then. You know who makes up the kingdom, the citizens of the kingdom of God? The saved. That, that, that is his kingdom, and he is Lord of them all. And, and so we find then that uh, the Lord Jesus wasn't, wasn't preaching it and, and, uh, about himself, he was preaching of what was to come, the kingdom of God, what, what would be near unto them. And the twelve, being the apostles, were with them. And a certain woman, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, of whom went, of whom went, of whom, out of whom, went seven devils. Now, I want you to see that this Mary Magdalene was a real person and a, a real follower of Christ. Now, excuse me, uh, first of all, that she had some maladies, she had some problems, she had some diseases in the flesh, as well as her demonic possession. Now, which do you think Mary found more hard, more hard to deal with. I'd be willing to bet that old Mary, before she was saved, gave priority to the flesh. Don't you think? And do you, do you think maybe what brought her to Jesus wasn't her spiritual condition, but rather her physical condition? And you know why? Because we always put that first, don't we? That's always in the driver's seat. That's always what we worry about. And when she arrived on the scene, Jesus cast out her devils, and she had seven of them. And I'd be willing to bet the Bible, when, when, when they have a bunch, if you'll follow the Bible, they'll foam at the mouth and thrash about and put themselves in fires and all that goes with that. But I want you to see it doesn't, it doesn't say a word about that concerning uh, Mary. All it says is that she had seven devils. You know what? I bet there's people that present very pleasantly that have more than seven devils. 
See, uh, we minimize that as Baptists, don't we? Uh, you know what? If you're spiritually discerned, you can pick up on them. I've met people where as soon as I met them, I was like, oh, man. And you know what I found in preaching? If you press that bunch a little bit, they get really mad. And, and, and so we find then as the Lord's people, uh, again, we have to acknowledge the reality that there are demon possessions. There are people walking around, possibly within our number, that's either being influenced by the devil or uh, devils or, in fact, possessed of the devil. She said, oh, Brother Larry, how do I know them? Well, let me ask you this. How's their service to the Almighty? How's their obedience to the Almighty? How do they lift up the praise to the only begotten? What's their behavior in the time of preaching? See, uh, those are some demonic... Uh, devil possess things we can look for that that we can say uh, we better watch this one we better take into consideration and, and so we see Mary Magdalene was just this type of person demonically possessed by seven different devils now go me to the gospel of John this time very familiar verses of scripture sometimes uh, I, I think we uh, missed the boat a little bit on it the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Now, I do want to point out on the timeline when this occurred, they were that the Lord Jesus was, was, was moving from the Old Testament and establishing the New Testament, and he was he was introducing or or beginning the Lord's table that speaks of him even to this day. Now listen, when the Lord begins to speak and manifest himself, the devil's always upset. Yeah. And, and, and so we find that in this, uh, in this uh, timing is no accident. In this timing is no, uh, no accident that it was, it was very much a part of the appointed things of God. The Gospel of John chapter 13, uh, verse 20. Uh, seven. The Bible says this. And after the shock, Satan entered un into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That that thou doest do quickly. Now, a lot of people um, say that Jesus let it happen. A lot of people said the shock even caused it. I don't believe that. All that soft was to say, listen, I know what you're up to. Uh, I know what you're going to do. And just do it. And when he got the soft, the Bible says that Satan entered into him. Now, it's one thing to be like Murray Magdalene that had seven devils. But you know what? They were the lower class devils. They were, they were part of that angel group that had failed. But it's quite the other thing that Satan, the despiser of God, the leader of that pack, he in fact it went into Judas. And you know why? They, he does the priority things. And he was, you know what? I believe this. I believe that Judas didn't, I mean, excuse me, that Satan didn't necessarily necessarily want Jesus to die because he begged him down to the cross. I think he wanted him locked up. I think he wanted his ministry to end. I don't think he wanted him to die. And the reason why, he knew the sacrifice would be complete. And so it was an ending the ministry thing because, see, uh, the devil doesn't want to ever complete the plan of God. And what this was was the completion of the plan of the sacrifice. And, and so we thought then that uh, what, a, what a scary, horrible thought that Satan entered into him. That Satan was on the inside. That he had a free range of someone's flesh. And listen, it's coming again. I don't know who it'll be. I've heard all the, the theories behind different cults and stuff like that. Hey, I don't know, but I do know it's going to come to pass. And probably he 
he's already living among us. Amen. And, and, and so we find then it's a very scary, scary thought to be demonically possessed. And it's even saved people a very scary thing to be demonically influenced. Now, remember the Bible says concerning David, he's a man after my own heart. And time and time and time again, he was hindered by the devil. He gave in to him just about as much as he resisted him. Bathsheba. What do you think about that? Doing an Israel census. What do you think about that? And so we find that the very cream of the crop, the best of the best, don't always live in victory. You know, uh, some Pentecostals, when they arrive at sinless perfection, whatever that is, they think they live in victory the rest of their days. Hey, I've been saved 40 years, and I can say unequivocally that I've had more bad days than good. And I believe if you was honest with me, you'd say the same thing. Yeah. And, and, and so we find then as the Lord's people that <laughs> certainly he's going to attack us, and certainly there are uh, demon-possessed people. Now, this is my own opinion, and the only scripture I have for it is where the Bible says that and say, uh, uh, concerning Judas is that he went to his place. Now, my own opinion is this. I don't think Satan has possessed anybody since then. He's saving it for the angel. Now, I believe there's been a lot of demonic people, uh, little devils in them. There was legion said as a time. I don't know how many. You ever wondered how many devils there are? Mm -hmm. Scary thought, ain't it? Yeah. And, and I know, I know uh, uh, the maniac of Gadara, he had, uh, he had a thousand on him, or two thousand. And Mer Magdalene had seven. But I believe Satan himself can't enter, I, I don't believe he'll waste his time until the end. And, and, and so we find then that, um, that Satan uses uh, his little devils to accomplish what he wants. The book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, I want to and I believe I've seen, I believe I've preached this wrong, and I believe I've seen others preach it wrong. But I want to look at this woman. Uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Anytime you do that, be careful. And the people with one accord gave heed unto the things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Now, I want you to see that in salvation, some of the times those unclean spirits are coming out. Now, we know from the experience of the maniac of Gadara, they want somewhere to live, don't they? Right. They want somewhere to abide. Yeah. And, and, and so we find that they're saved and the unclean spirit. Hey, this is what I want you to notice. It's a lot more common than you think. I don't know how many people were saved under Philip's ministry on this occasion, but I do know it said a bunch of unclean came out of them. You know what? That's why I expect on the Word of God, when people are saved, when they're truly saved, they'll begin to act different. They'll begin to crave the things of God. You know why? Because that old devil's went out of them. And, and, and so we find then that the Lord uh, used Philip his preaching in the same way. And listen, this is stuff that's minimized by the Baptists great and large today. Verse 8, and there was great joy in that city. Now, I want you to see what followed the demonic 
relief was joy. Second fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy. How many miserable people do you see on a daily basis? Or maybe I should ask you this better, because then your answer won't have to be as long. How many joyful people do you see on the average day? Very few, right? Yeah. Well, one thing I can come to is they're either demonically possessed or they're demonically influenced because that is not the place where God's people ought to abide. They ought to abide in happiness and joy, irregardless of the circumstance, irregardless of the situation. Be rejoicing that God is in control. Now, drop down to verse 23, and this was the uh, the situation with the faith. The, the situation uh, where uh, the sorcerer Simon was supposedly saved. But notice what Peter says, verse 24. Uh, verse 23, excuse me. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine uh, heart may be forgiven thee. Now I want you to see it's a heart problem, a soul problem, an inner man problem. For I perceive that thou art in a gall of bitterness. Now see, God's people ought not to abide in a situation like that, in a gall. Uh, uh, you know, I know uh, th this was Donna's situation, and as a nurse I've seen it down through the years. When Donna's gallbladder, and the reason it's called is the stuff in the gallbladder is real bitter. That's where the gall, the gall bitterness comes from. You know, Donna didn't hurt all the time. That's why we weren't sure if it's even what it was. Sarah was three months old at this, maybe not even that old, and we thought maybe it was something from the delivery of the baby. But you know what happened? It attacked her and it come and went. And every time it came, it got worse. And she couldn't stand the pain. And then she went to vomiting. It made her so sick. And, and it's the very same thing with, uh, with Simon the sorcerer here. His bitterness came out. It revealed what was on the inside. It revealed that he'd never been born again. It revealed that he was a fake. And what did it do? His bitterness against other people. You know what? I've done the same thing. Get mad at people. Get upset with different ones. And what spews out of me is bitterness. And that denies the very God that saved me. Bitter people, listen, you watch them. People that don't rejoice in preaching, you watch them. You know what? And I've seen a lot of this in 26 years. People that run, run from preaching, watch them with two eyes. And, and, and so we find then that the Lord, uh, that the demons are going to make you feel bitter and angry against other people. They always do that. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew 8, 16. Matthew 8, 16. And when even was come, they brought unto him, meaning Christ, many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Now, I want you to see the means of casting out. It's not today. I command you come out of him. It's good old-fashioned preaching. Not a little Sunday school lesson that tells you a story, not preaching that's less than a Sunday school story, but teaching the Word of God. You know what I found with people like that? They'll either get out or the Lord save them. Uh, we need, as the Lord's people, to pray. Listen, lost children, lost grandchildren, uh, your door's wide open. Lost people out in the world, you're an open target. You know, uh, 
I believe that was the goal of Armenian teaching. Let's make salvation something very, very easy or very non-biblical. And that way we can fill up the church with demon-possessed people. Do you ever wonder if that was Satan's plan behind Armenian doctrine? I fully believe that. That he wanted some fakes among the people. And so he made it very easy. Accept Jesus. Invite him into your heart. And all is going to be well. But you know what that lacks? That lacks your sealed unto the day of redemption. It lacks, it lacks the seal. And as long as the seal's not there, listen, you can be demonically possessed. And it's a very, very scary thought. Where do you stand this morning? Are you lost? And you know yourself, you're on your way to hell? Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Have you been influenced by the, the devils that are out there so much you're sick of it? Well, get yourself right with the Lord. Uh, and maybe, maybe you're in a good shape. You know what I want you to do? I want you to pray for the others. Pray for me. Pray for me. If you can't pray for nobody else, that we might be found in the will of the Lord. That's